And that concludes our look at data binding in ASP.NET. Um, we talked initially just about how to do binding, setting up the data source property and calling the data bind method. Then we looked at how declarative data sources give us a um, way of abstracting away some of that data access and uh, moving the data access code into the framework. We looked at the SQL data source in some detail, how it's an abstraction over the ADO.NET APIs for retrieving data. Talked about storing your connection strings in that nice connection strings element inside of your configuration file. And we looked at several different controls, the grid view, details view, repeater, and data list, to name a few. Um, now the next module we're going to be looking at uh, for data binding will include more details on the parameter mappings as well as different data sources. So if, you're, if you um, are feeling like the only way to retrieve data at this point is uh, via a database, stay tuned for the next module. We'll take a look at using XML as data sources as well as objects and um, middle tiers. Let's start here with a look at the process of binding data to controls in ASP.NET. Um, at its core, it's, it's pretty straightforward. Any control that supports data binding needs to have two features. One is a property called data source. So it must have a public property called data source, which accepts uh, any object, although it typically is going to be an enumerable collection of something. And then it needs to define a method called data bind. Uh, also public, and the way you work with data bound controls in ASP.NET is you set their data source property to some collection of data, and then you call their data bind method to have them bring that data into their um, internal collection and prepare for presentation. So let's go ahead and try performing some simple data binding in ASP.NET. Okay, so to try out some data binding in ASP.NET, I'm going to create a new website and um, let's just call this our data binding demos website and to give ourselves something to look at I have a SQL Server Express database here called movie reviews that contains a number of movies and reviews so we'll have something to um, try out and I also have the connection string to the local SQL uh, Express database prepared here, so we don't need to type that in. Okay, so um, what I'd like to do is bind the movies to a grid. So let's just put an instance of the grid view onto our page. This is one of the controls that gives you sort of the most bang for your buck. It'll show um, all of the uh, rows in the result set, and it'll uh, set up the columns for you based on the metadata. And let's call this our movie, uh, movies grid. And uh, just to show you what's in the database, so you can see what we're trying to retrieve here. Let's open it up and notice there are two tables. There's movies and reviews. What I'm going to do is pull out movies from the movies table. And um, let's get you know maybe the top 20, and we'll retrieve those three columns. So let me go into our code behind and go ahead and retrieve data, and then populate the grid view with that data using the data source property and calling data bind like I showed you on the slide. So first we're going to bring in um, a couple of ADO.NET classes or namespaces, system.data, and using system.data.sql client, which is the SQL Server provider uh, namespace. And let's go ahead and create a um, SQL connection. And we'll set that equal to a new SQL connection, and we'll prepare a Data, uh, data source name right here, string DSN. We'll set that equal to that string that I copied in from the file. Okay, and once we have the connection, we're going to create a SQL command to go retrieve data. And this will be a SQL command. And we'll initialize that to select uh, top 20, movie ID. Uh, let's see what those titles, those columns were again title and release date. So title and release date from movies. And we'll pass in the connection that we just prepared. Now I'm putting these in a using block so that they are properly disposed of uh, by the time you get down to this terminating brace down here. Okay, so I have a SQL command ready to go. Let's open the connection knowing that it will be closed at the termination of this block with a using statement. 
and go ahead and bind the result of that query to my grid view. So inside of here, let's go ahead and um, prepare a SQL data reader. So reader, set that equal to command.execute uh, reader, execute reader. So that'll return the results from our query back. And then we're going to take our movies grid dot data source. So this is the key to data binding right here, and set that equal to the reader. And then movies grid dot data bind is how you actually perform the binding. And I have a problem in my string up here. I forgot to escape my backslashes. Let's do that. And we should be good to go. Okay, so let's retrieve the data. So again, what the process of data binding is just setting the data source property and invoking the data bind method on the control. All of this is just the data access code to retrieve some data. We could equally be doing this with a intermediate data access layer, a set of classes, um, an array of uh, elements or whatever. So let's try running the page now. And with any luck, we'll see the top 20 movies inside of the database, great. So that's the sort of basics of um, data binding in ASP.NET. Now what actually happens when you perform that data binding is uh, we set the data source control. When you invoke data bind, that causes the control to uh, retrieve data from the data source that you initialized. And it's going to create its own local cache of that data um, just so that it can keep it around between the time when you bind the data and the time that actually it actually needs to render the data out to the response. Um, so that's the process. You set up the data source, call data bind, creates a local cache with its own copy of the data, and eventually renders it back to the client. Now, binding data to controls doesn't have to be as complex um, as I just showed you in terms of going out to a database, retrieving data, and binding it to a complex uh, grid control. Um, it can be something very straightforward, like taking an array of strings and binding it to a list box. Uh, so it, we, you can sort of range across the whole uh, sequence here and look at um, different types of data binding. But uh, let me just give you an overall impression of what's possible. So what controls can you bind to, and what types of data can you bind uh, from? Um, so here's a list of, of the controls in ASP.NET that support data binding. But generally, just you know, you can basically look at a control, and if it supports uh, collections of items when it displays, it will inevitably support data binding. So you can pretty much use your intuition and figure this out. Um, but just to give you a couple of ideas here, uh, many of these are, are specific to data binding, uh, you know, designed just for data binding, like the grid view, the details view, the data list, the repeater, etc. But some of the other ones are more common controls that you might use outside of the context of data binding as well. Things like a list box and a combo box and a drop-down list. So keep those in mind. Now things you can bind to, what I just showed you was binding to a data reader. That was, uh, that was a class that implemented the iDataReader interface. And you can certainly do that, but you can also bind to the more generic iEnumerable, which is any collection of items in .NET uh, that implements iEnumerable. And that opens up a lot of doors, including all of the collection classes you might be used to using. Um, I should also mention, mention it's possible to bind to data tables and data sets if you're using the disconnected ADO.NET data model by retrieving data into a data set. And you can also bind to data views, which is a filtering mechanism on top of data tables. So let's go try a simpler data bind, just to give us something else to contrast with here. So I'm going to um, go ahead and add a new web form to my site. And let's call this um, simple data bind. And in our simple version, let's go ahead and just drop a uh, list box onto here. I will put an instance of the list box onto my form. And let's just call this um, number list box. And let's go ahead in our code behind. So what I'm going to do is just declare a local string array, and let's call this um, number array, and set it equal to a new string array that we will initialize with some static values. So the string 0, the string 1, the string 2, string 3, string 4, etc. 
And to do the binding, we just take our number list box, set the data source equal to our number array, and then we call data bind just like we did before on the grid. And that should be sufficient to take the values in this array and drop them into the list box on the form. So we try running, and there we go. We have a list box populated with numeric values pulled from, a, from a, an array. So uh, keep that in mind that data binding is anytime you need, need to uh, take a collection of items and bind them to a control, um, data binding will uh, enable that for you. Another possibility for data binding, uh, instead of calling data bind directly on the control, you can actually call it once on the page. And by calling it at the top level page, it will recursively call data bind on all the controls that have a data bind method on that page. Now, you, you won't find this useful that often, to be honest with you, uh, but there are occasions where it, it, it uh, simplifies things and it can be useful. Um, and the reason I mentioned you probably won't find it that uh, useful that often is that um, usually your data binding process is very specific uh, and, and time sensitive. So in that previous example, the grid, when I went out and retrieved data from a database, I had to bind the data at that time. Um, I couldn't do it later on because I had the data reader prepared and it was ready to, to um, send back data and I needed to iterate across it. Um, but if you have a, a data sources that are static in nature, arrays, that, type, that kind of thing, um, you can do something like this where you just set the data sources of your controls and then place a top-level call to data bind on your page. So let me just show you a, qu a quick example of doing that. Let's go back to our uh, simple uh, data bind page that we we're putting together. And let's just put another couple of controls on here. Uh, drop down list one. Let's also put a checkbox list onto here. And then in our code behind, what I could do is instead of calling data binding directly like this, is I could say drop down list one dot data source is equal to number um, array. And I could say um, list. Um, checkbox list one dot data source is equal to number array as well and then we could simply call uh, page dot data bind or this dot data bind and that will take care to invoke the data bind method on all three of these controls and they should all be bound to that array of four numbers as we see so Possibility, uh, probably won't use it too often, but um, good to know that that is the effect of calling data bind on the page, page class. While we're on the topic of binding to simpler controls, one thing you'll uh, run into pretty quickly is the problem of taking a rectangular data source and binding it to a single dimensional control like a list box or a drop down list. Um, so if you're trying to retrieve data from a database and place it into a drop down list, uh, you need to create a mapping for which columns of your query map onto which um, properties of the items within one of these controls. So there are two fields you can use in all of these um, single dimensional controls that support data binding that lets you uh, describe the mapping. So data text field is the field from the underlying data source that you want to display and data value field is the field in the underlying data source that you want to have set as the value element um, inside of the rendering. So let's go try that out real quick here. I'm going to add a new page to our site to test this, and let's call it <clears throat> text and value. And let's go ahead and put a drop down list onto the page. And I'm going to bind this to the same. Uh, query that I issued earlier against the data, uh, the grid view. So let me go grab that data retrieval code here, like we had before, drop it in here, and bring in those two namespaces as well. Okay, so instead of the movies grid, we're going to bind to the uh, drop down um, list. And before we do the binding, we're going to set the data text field equal to um, title of the movie and the drop down list dot data value field equal to movie ID. 
Okay, so that will tell it where to send the respective columns of the underlying query into this data source, uh, into this control. So when you run this, notice we get the uh, names shown up in the drop-down list. And if you look at the source for the page, you'll notice that uh, the value of each of those elements was set to the corresponding identifier of the movie in the underlying database. And you could, of course, retrieve that programmatically as you are interacting with these controls. But that's how you, you set up the mapping, data text field and data value field to go from a rectangular data source into a single dimensional control. One of the features that was in, introduced in ASP.NET version two was the declarative data source. And the goal behind the declarative data source is to um, take away the mundane data access code that you tend to write uh, again and again when you're trying to retrieve data from a database and place it uh, through data binding into a control. Um, so these, these declarative data sources uh, take over the responsibility of interacting with the database for you or some other data source, as we'll see, and uh, even make it easier to um, set up the data binding process. So let's go try out a declarative data source here. Now what I thought I would do is go back to the original demonstration with the grid view and I'm going to show you how we can use a declarative data source to perform this same query that we were doing uh, manually before. And to do this, what I'm going to do is split the windows so we can sort of see both at the same time. And let's go ahead and add a declarative data source control to our page. Now the one we're going to use is the SQL data source. Uh, run it in a server. And let's call this our movies data source. Okay, now <clears throat> what I want you to do is think about what would be necessary for us to add as parameters to this control here for it to take over the responsibility of performing this data access that you see on the bottom. So let's just take a look at this code here. How could we um, provide a set of parameters to instrument this code and make it ge generic, which is the purpose of the data source control. Well, the first parameter I see is the connection string. So we definitely need a connection string property. And in fact, we'll find one here. Connection string is right there. So we'll set the connection string to something. Let's just go ahead and copy that out while we're here. And I do need to, uh, this time, take out my escape characters since we're in XML now. Okay, so there's our connection string. What else do we need here? Connection is kind of implicit. Um, the command, we definitely need a command, right? Here's the command that we issued to perform that retrieval. So we'll go add that as a parameter as well, uh, as a property. Uh, it turns out the command here is going to be called select command. What is the command you want to use to perform your data retrieval with a select query? And that looks like it should be it. Those are the only two specific pieces of information in our data access code at this point. Um, so the rest of it should be uh, easy to automate when we have that, that, um, those pieces of data. So I'm going to comment out <clears throat> the data retrieval code that we were doing by hand here earlier. And I'm going to instead use that new data source control. So I'm going to put our data binding code down here. And instead of setting that equal to a reader, what I can do is set it equal to the movies data source dot select method call. And this takes a uh, data source select arguments, which we'll take a look at a bit later. But right now we just create a new instance of data source select arguments. And it will take care of uh, generating all of the data access code for us. And um, we'll take the results and bind it to our control. So there we go, we have the same results, but this time we didn't have to write any of the data access code. It was handled for us by this declarative data source control. Now, while that data source performed essentially the same function, um, I wasn't quite telling the truth when I said it did exactly the same thing. Uh, just because of the way the data source retrieves data by default, by default, the SQL data source will use the data set and prepare a SQL data adapter and populate the, the data set and then use that to bind to the control. 
However, you can change that if you want to. You can go into your data source and specify um, data source mode equals data reader, and now it will be exactly the same as the code that we wrote before. So there's the data reader model. Of course, we don't see any visual distinction between the two, um, but under the covers, it will be using the uh, SQL data reader instead of the data set and SQL data adapter. As you probably guessed, you can actually take declarative data sources and bind them declaratively to controls. There's actually no need to go out to um, your code and, and perform that binding. You can have it happen implicitly. And the way you make it happen implicitly is you use this attribute, data source ID, on the data bound control and point it to the identifier of the declarative data source you want it to use to populate its contents. And as we'll see, there's extensive designer support for working with these, and it adds a lot more um, features to the data binding process um, based on the capabilities of the data source. So let's go back to our example and switch this out so that we're no longer doing anything in our code behind. So this is not even necessary now. If I go into our ASPX file, go to my grid and set the data source ID equal to the movie's data source. So if we go ahead and run that, again, it should look exactly the same, which is a good thing. But now we are relieved of even having to call data bind ourselves. Now data binding, data bind is still being called under the covers, just so you know. Um, and the data source is being set, but it's no longer done by us. It's done through this declarative relationship that was established between the data bound control and the corresponding data source. Now how this process of declarative data binding actually works um, feels initially so somewhat mysterious. You just create this relationship between the two controls and suddenly the data flows and your, your uh, grids are presenting. Um, I wanted to step back and sort of show you exactly what's happening when a request comes in for a control that is, has been uh, set up with declarative data binding. So this slide will do that for us. A request comes in uh, and we have our grid view prepared to bind to a declarative data source. And what happens is during the life cycle of the page um, in a virtual method of the base class of the, of the grid view called create child controls, there's a method called ensure data bound that's going to be called. And in, inside of that, that will check to see if there is a data source ID um, populated with this control. That is the hint that the control should be using declarative data sources, uh, is, is um, having that data source ID uh, property populated. So if it's there, it's going to go ahead and uh, invoke the select method on the data source, just like we did by hand earlier. And the select method, of course, goes out to the data source, which in our case is a database, performs the query, sends the results back, and whether the results are actually um, cached in an intermediate representation like I'm showing you here or not depends on whether you're using the data source mode of data set or data reader. If it's data reader, these will essentially be streamed right through the data source. If it's data set, there will indeed be an intermediate cache in the form of a data table inside of a data set. Regardless, the control will then proceed to perform the bind and create its own local cache of the data like we saw earlier in data binding so that by the time you get to the render method of the request processing, it will have all of the contents in place. And if you want to see where this code actually is, you can kind of dig into the controls and uh, it's in the base class data bound control from which the uh, grid view control inherits. And you'll see that call to ensure data bound, which checks for the identifier to see if there is an ID data source identifier populated and whether it needs to be data bound or not. And if both of those are true, it proceeds with the data binding, which will go through that process we just described. Now the SQL data source that we've been using um, supports more than just that select statement that we were injecting. It actually has support for the full complement of SQL-based interactions, the uh, insert, the delete, the update, and the select. 
And it, uh, as you saw, supports both data reader and data set based retrieval. And as we'll see later, there's support for caching the results of the data set based retrieval. Um, there's also a filter expression associated with it where you can apply constraints to a query uh, declaratively. And there's support for enabling things like sorting and as we'll see later, um, paging as well. And it's important that all of these features are part of this control because as we tie these controls together, we start taking our grids and, and other controls and tie them to these data sources, we're going to see much more functionality that is enabled by default in these controls uh, because the data source knows how to do so much more. So here's uh, some of the more important properties and methods of the data source control. Um, we've seen the select command, that's the one that we've been using to actually perform the select and data retrieval. Um, but there's a similar uh, command for inserting, updating, deleting, and you'll notice each of these commands has an associated collection of parameters. So we, don't, we aren't restricted to uh, generic queries. You can also perform parameterized queries, which of course is going to be required if you're doing anything that makes a modification, inserts, updates, or deletes. Um, so what I thought I would do to show you just a, a bit more about the SQL data source control is go back to our uh, sample page here and let's go add one more page to our collection. So SQL data source is the name of the page I'm going to create. And what I thought I would do is just um, place an instance of that data source control that we defined earlier right here. We'll drop that guy on. And I'm going to put a button on here. And what I want to show you is how I can use the data source control to actually insert a new uh, row into a table. So let's just do insert uh, new movie. So there's our, our um, button to perform the insertion. Let's go ahead and head and add a handler for that button. So to do insert movie. All right, and uh, in order for our data source to be able to do that insertion, we're going to need to add a couple more pieces of information. One is the insert command, which we're going to populate with an insert into movies and we'll specify a, the uh, two parameters necessary because the um, identifier of the movie is an auto increment field. So release date and title are the two parameters and we'll specify values as variables. So title and um, release date like so. So there's the SQL for doing the insertion. Now uh, once we have a command like an insert command that requires parameters to successfully execute, we'll need to um, define those parameters as part of the SQL data source. So inside of here, I'm going to populate an inner element called insert parameters. And here we're just going to place a bunch of parameters. And we'll talk more about these different types of parameters you can use in our next discussion. Um, but I'm just going to use generic parameters for now with a uh, name corresponding to the name of the variables in our um, insert command. So this is going to be a string. And we'll do the same thing for the um, release date, like so. And the type of that is going to be date time. OK, so now our SQL data source is prepared to perform insertions. And we should be able to take advantage of that. Uh, again, I'm just going to do this um, in code to show you what's possible. So let's take our movies data source and perform the insert. So that's how you do an insertion. But of course, we need some values to actually put in there. So before you do the insertion, we're going to populate the values of the insert parameters collection. So I'm going to go to the insert parameters collection, go grab the um, title. Um, property, the title parameter. And the simplest way to do this here is to set the, the default value. If you're using one of the other parameters, the value will be inferred from some other source, as we'll see later. Um, but here we're just going to hard code it. So insert parameters, and we'll set the uh, release date 
equal to uh, 1, 1, 2008, maybe. And that should be sufficient to perform the insertion. And, and this should give you an idea of how controls can take advantage of this. Um, so they know there's a data source that is capable of performing insertion as long as they can provide the necessary parameter values to make that insertion succeed. And they don't need to know anything else. They don't need to know about the underlying database or the connection or anything else. Okay, so we've inserted the, move, the uh, new movie. It should have uh, been populated into our database, um, as we see here. Now let's go see if we can retrieve that um, when we're performing our select in the initial page here. So what I'm going to do is um, order by um, movie ID descending. So that should give us the one that was most recently inserted first, which hopefully is going to be our movie. And there it is. So SQL data source, a very powerful control that um, gives controls that want to use it the full complement of functionality uh, available for the backend data source. In all the examples I've shown you so far, we've been uh, hard coding the connection strings in place just by assigning them directly to either the um, SQL connection class or uh, setting up the connection string property in the declarative data source. It turns out though there's a um, connection string configuration section that is designed specifically to store connection strings and you really want to take advantage of this most of the time. So instead of hard coding your connection strings just drop them into this connection strings section of the configuration file and the format is um, place an add element with a name, a connection string, and optionally a provider name, which is only necessary if you're not using SQL client or SQL server provider. And then you can pull that out of the, connect, uh, the, of the uh, configuration file by using the configuration manager uh, programmatically, or there's a syntax you can use to declaratively extract it inside of your um, markup. So this is the declarative syntax. Use the dollar uh, percent dollar sign notation. Give it the connection string prefix and then colon the name of the connection string you want to have extracted at that location. So let's try this out. Try to uh, factor out our connection string into a connection string section of the um, configuration file. So I'm going to go take this connection string here that was currently hard-coded cut it out and go into our configuration file. And inside of here, we'll just expand the connection strings section. And we're going to add a new connection string. Specify the name of um, movies connection string. And a connection string value equal to the one that I just copied from the declarative data source. So there, we should be able to use that. Now going back to our markup file, the ASPX file, and now use that um, dollar syntax to extract the connection strings um, from the configuration file and give it the name movies connection string of the actual connection string we want to pull out. And let's just make sure we got the right name here. So movies connection string looks good. And if we try running, we should see that that connection string is now pulled out of the configuration file. So that's one way to get it. The other way is if you were doing this um, programmatically, let me actually go to the code behind here and rewrite this line of code right here and use the um, uh, programmatic access for the configuration file. So to do this, you use the configuration manager class, which is in system.configuration, dot connection strings indexed by movie connection strings, a string, and then you access the connection string portion of the string. So that's how you would uh, extract the value of the connection string programmatically, and this is how you extract it declaratively. Let's uh, take a look at a couple of the more complex data binding controls now in more detail. We'll start with the grid view, which is one we've seen already a couple of times. It's the one that renders the tabular grid of data and um, 
like I said, gives you a lot of capability with, uh, in general, pretty small amount of effort, so it's quite useful. Um, this grid view is actually the successor to an older control called the data grid, which was essentially retired with the last release of ASP.NET. And the goal behind the grid view was to um, do everything the data grid did, but do it in a more modular way and a way that um, is, is easier to use. And they've, they've achieved that for the most part. It, um, as you've seen, it's very straightforward to use. Uh, it also has several pre-built fields um, to represent certain types of data. So there's an image field if you want to bind to an image inside of a database. There's a checkbox field that's used by default when you're binding to Boolean values. And there's a hyperlink field you can set up if you want to associate a hyperlink with um, data retrieved from an underlying data source. And as we'll see, the grid view has uh, intelligent interaction with data source control. So you can very easily enable things like pagination, editing, deleting, and sorting without having to do any work behind the scenes because the, data gr uh, the grid view is capable of interacting with the data source control in a very sophisticated way. So what I thought I would do to show you some of that sophistication is go ahead and put a grid view on our form, on a, on a new form here. Let's create another web form. So um, full grid, let's call it. And instead of dropping the grid on directly from the data collection toolbox, I'm going to go into design view and drill into my database that I've opened inside of the server explorer and just drag my movies table onto the form. And what this will do is a couple things. First, it will generate a new instance of the grid view for you. And second, it will generate a declarative data source which has been initialized to that movies table. And notice what we have in terms of options here. Uh, we can immediately enable paging and sorting and editing and deleting and even selection. And just to make it look a little nicer, let's uh, change the appearance to be something slightly different. And if you want to, you can go in and customize the appearance of any individual columns. So we can go edit the um, columns of the grid. For example, let's make the primary key column uh, non-visible. And let's change the release date to have a data format string of 0 colon D, which will give it a short date format. If you are going to use that um, data formatting, you do need to take care and disable the HTML encoding for that to work right. All right, and that should be it. Now notice how much functionality we have um, just by uh, dropping the grid onto our form and uh, letting it associate with a fully stocked SQL data source. If we go ahead and run this, notice that it's binding to all of the mov movies in the table, and I can go ahead and do the, the um, pagination, which is working nicely. I can also use the sorting. That's all working fine. Notice I click it a second time and it does an inverse sort. Similarly, we can sort by release date and back and forth. If I want to change one of the movie titles, I come in here and maybe add a S to Torturer, and I've made a modification to it. So pretty extensive um, functionality that, that is achieved with the uh, data source control and the grid view, um, just with the default uh, properties. Now, one thing I do, do want to mention here is that a lot of those features you see in the grid view, and we'll, we'll talk more about this in our next module, but a lot of those features are dependent on the data source's data set mode. So if we set the data source mode of this SQL data source to data reader instead of the default data set, you'll notice that a lot of those features that uh, we had by default are no longer functional. So notice we can't have paging enabled because paging relies on the data set for retrieval and or for, for indexing. And if you think about it, it makes sense. It, it would be um, pretty close to impossible to create a generic control which um, performed paging across an arbitrary SQL query on the back side. So this relies on the data set to, be, to keep the data in memory to perform the uh, functions like sorting. The other control I wanted to show you here is the details view control. And this one pairs rather nicely with the grid view since it uh, is often used for master detail displays where you want to um, let the user select a row in the grid 
and have that display details about that row or perhaps a, a reference to a uh, data in another table's row um, upon selection. And um, in terms of uh, interface, uh, if you're familiar with the old access style applications where you had a next, next, uh, or next, previous, first, and last interface as you navigated through rows in a uh, underlying table, this essentially supports that model. So if you want to show just one row at a time of an underlying result set, the details view is the control you want to reach for. Uh, it supports paging, which is how you're going to go from one row to the next. It also supports editing and deleting and inserting, which is something um, that before the details view came along, we always had to do by hand in ASP.NET. So that's a, a welcome addition. So let's go try out the details view to get a sense for how this is going to work. So I'm going to drop an instance of the details view onto my form here. And my goal is to have um, this details view show reviews from the underlying uh, database. Remember I have a reviews table here, which has a foreign key reference to the movie table. So every time the user clicks on a movie in my grid, I'd like to show the user uh, the reviews associated with that movie inside of this details view. So I've got the details view. Let's go ahead and set it up with a data source. And I'm going to prepare a new data source. We'll choose uh, database. And we'll set it up to point to our local movies database file. We'll call this uh, movies connection string 2. And we're going to have this retrieve data from the reviews database, uh, reviews table. And we're going to put a where clause on it, where I want to set the movie ID equal to the value coming in from the grid view of the currently selected row. So this is a way of declaratively setting up a parameter um, in my data source control here that's going to associate the value of the parameter with the value retrieved from another control on the form. We're going to talk much more about these parameters in our next module, but I wanted to sort of give you a preview of what's possible. And the other thing I'm going to do is use the advanced tab here to generate the rest of the insert, update, and delete statements for my declarative data source. And that should be good to go. So that should be wired up to the selection uh, change of the grid view above us. And let's turn on paging so, so we can flip through the various features. And let's um, set the appearance to be similar to the grid view that is above it. All right. Uh, one more thing you could do here if you wanted to is we could um, enable inserting of new uh, reviews on that particular film if we wanted to. You could also enable editing as well as deleting. So let's try just running that. And again, you can get a sense for what's possible with these declarative data sources, uh, is that you can select uh, one of these films. And down below, you'll see it has the review associated with that film. And we can tab through the four different reviews that are uh, in the database for that film. Obviously, we could use a little formatting help here, but hopefully you get the idea of um, the ease with which you can set up master detail relationships between the grid view and the details view um, because of the uh, full featured nature of the declarative data sources. One of the most powerful features of the data binding controls in ASP.NET is the ability to templatize the controls so they take on whatever appearance you um, want them to take on. And templates are supported by several of the controls that are available in ASP.NET, including the grid view, the details view, the form view, and list view, which we haven't looked at yet, but we will next, as well as the um, older repeater and data list controls, which we're going to start with here. So the basic idea behind a template is it lets you provide the shell for displaying the data. So basically, you're going to do the layout of what an individual items should look like when the data binding process kicks in. And it lets you completely take over. You can decide exactly how the data should be displayed. And you write the HTML to uh, show it how it should display the item. Um, the control itself will take care of the layout and the data binding for you, typically. And by layout, I mean, for example, the grid would take care of rendering the table surrounding you. And you would just describe uh, an item template or a, a data template for one of the um, cells in the table. And then the other piece you're going to have to use is the evaluation syntax to extract pieces of the underlying 
row in the uh, result set that you're bound to to drop them into your template. So here's the model that templates support. Um, basically when data binding is performed, if you have a data bound control with templates, each row in the data source is, uh, every time you, you encounter a new row in the data source, it's going to go out to your user defined template and take whatever template you have defined and stamp it into the rendered results, replacing any um, evaluation pieces of uh, markup with real values from the underlying row that you're currently bound to. So all of the mechanism of data binding and uh, control rendering is still taken care of for you. You don't have to worry about uh, going to that level, but it does give you the ability to define exactly what um, the item should look like when it's being rendered. So the one other piece you'll need to know is um, how to extract um, values from the underlying row to drop into your template definition. And there's a uh, syntax that's available to do this. It's a special syntax for um, use only within templates. And it looks like this. It's got a uh, percent sign hash mark symbol. And then you place an expression here. And this expression is uh, typically just going to be an instance of this function right here, eval. And to just use eval and the name of the column whose value you want to extract uh, and place at a certain location. Let's start by looking at the simplest of all of the controls that support templating. And this is a good uh, control to start working with to get your head around how this works. So the repeater control is um, just a control that renders whatever you tell it to render. It has no uh, rendering by default of its own and it's completely up to you to define what is going to be output when this thing renders. It does set up the data binding for you though, so the data source is already set up for you and it will go through the data source and bind each element to an item template that you define. So what you're going to do in, an, in a repeater is define this item template and place whatever you want to in here. So notice, notice how flexible this is. I've, I've placed uh, just some text and in the text I've placed these uh, evaluation syntax pieces where I want to extract the name from the underlying row, then I want to extract the breed, and then I'm also going to use a server-side image control here and extract the image URL which I'm storing in the, in the database and drop that in as the value for the image URL property of this server-side control. So you can really do whatever you want. It's uh, completely up to you and that the repeater is going to go through the data source and apply your template as many times as there are rows in the underlying result set. So let's go try this out. I'm going to go create yet another new page to work on here. And let's call this our repeater page. And what I thought I would do is go grab uh, an existing data source that I already have in place so we don't have to replicate that. And we'll hit our, hit our movie database again. Uh, but this time, I'm going to render them as uh, render the movies as a uh, repeater. So I'm going to drop an instance of the repeater class in here, and let's just call this the uh, movies repeater. And we'll set the data source ID for this control equal to the movies data source defined just above. And then inside of the repeater, um, what you do is define an item template. So how often or what are we going to render each time we have a row in the underlying result set. And if you notice, all we're getting back for our result set is the movie ID, the title, and the release date. So let's just write a little markup here um, to print out these values. So ID is going to be, let's do this, strong, I, whoops, strong uh, ID. We'll set that equal to an evaluation syntax for the title in the underlying row. Just put a simple break in here and we'll do the same thing for the um, title, which is right here, and the release date. Or just, let's just say date. Okay, so there's the title. And this is of course going to be ID, not title, and this one's going to be release date. So you just, just do whatever you want here. Let's put a um, horizontal break, horizontal line um, after each one. And um, the one other thing that's useful to know is this evaluation function that you can use inside of the syntax. 
supports a formatting string as well. So if I want to, I can go in here and say, uh, I want this date to be formatted as a short date string instead of printing out the default to string of that date. So that can be useful if you're trying to format the output. So let's try running that, and I should get our um, individual elements printed out here. So this, of course, should have been movie ID, not ID. There we go. And there we go. All the movies are bound. So extremely flexible controller repeater. Um, the, the power of using these templates um, just makes it, uh, opens up a lot of doors. You can, you can really do a lot of interesting layout um, in, in a very succinct way using these template-based controls. Another control that's quite useful uh, that also supports templates is the data list control. Um, this is also pretty low level, very much like the repeater, although it does give you some layout. So the repeater gives you no layout whatsoever. It's completely up to you what is going to be rendered. The data list, on the other hand, is going to render a, an HTML table. And what it will do is uh, render one of your item templates, or render your item template, into each cell of the table. And you could decide how many cells wide the table is going to be, and it will just keep um, uh, rendering new rows as long as there are new results to render from the underlying result set. So you could do something like this, and th this is great for um, page layouts where you want to present data in multi -columns, uh, multiple columns, and each, each uh, cell should represent uh, one row in the underlying table that you're uh, bound to. So you can do something interesting like this. You can actually present you know, my uh, dog table here is uh, showing the dogs with their name and breed underneath them, and I'm putting two abreast here um, to display to the user. So let's go try using the data list now in our sample code. In fact, I'm going to use this repeater and just um, copy it and turn it into a data list instead. So data list, and we'll keep it with the same um, data source, obviously. We'll call this the um, movie data list. And what we'll do in our item template is leave it pretty much the same, although I'm going to take out this horizontal uh, line. And then I'm going to uh, tweak a couple things here. Let's add the um, uh, repeat columns. How many columns should we repeat? And let's, let's do four. So we, we want to see four uh, columns uh, across the, each row that's displayed. And then you can also specify the repeat direction. Which way do you want this thing to go? And let's choose um, horizontal so that it repeat, repeats going from left to right and then scrolling back to the bottom. So that will, um, let's just put a break between these two so we can tell the difference. So that should show my movies in this data list for abreast and um, in a nice layout. So there we go. And again, you can sort of tweak the formatting to get it to look exactly like you want, but uh, it's a quick way to get some nice layout without having to uh, manage the details of uh, when you want to wrap rows and when you want to um, go to the next line. This is Fritz Onion with Pluralsight, and we'll be looking at data binding in ASP.NET here. Uh, there is a follow-up module to this one called Data Binding 2 which will present some more advanced topics in data binding, and I encourage you to check that out as well. In this module, we're going to be looking at the process of data binding. What are the mechanics involved with actually taking a data source and binding it to a control? We'll talk about how to do this imperatively, so you can write code to actually do the binding, and what controls are available to bind to. We'll talk about binding at the page level. It's possible to actually bind once at the page level and have that bind propagate to a, a collection of controls on your page, if you like. Uh, we'll talk about the issue of binding rectangular data sources to single dimensional controls like a list box or drop down list and how you can control the mappings. And then we'll take a look at declarative data sources. So this takes away some of the um, effort of uh, actually going out to a data source and then retrieving it and populating a control. Um, in the form of a server-side control. So there are these data source controls we're going to be looking at, uh, and the, the one we'll focus on primarily in this module is the SQL data source, which is an encapsulation of a SQL query against a back-end database. We'll talk about where to store your connection strings. Uh, we'll look at the grid view and the details view for creating uh, grid presentations and master detail relationships.
and we'll finish up with a look at data binding templates, which is the general mechanism for customizing the appearance of data bound controls. And specifically, we're going to look at the repeater, one of the most generic uh, template-based controls, as well as the data list.